everyone out there. This is Steve Marinucci, Beatles Examiner, welcoming you to another of our weekly crazy discussion forums of things we said today. Before we get started, let me introduce uh, who's on board with us today. Uh, first, uh, out there in uh, Pennsylvania, um, part of Beatle fans since almost the beginning. Since the beginning? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Pretty much, pretty much. Mr. Al Sussman. Uh, good evening, Al. Hi, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And from also from the East Coast, from Connecticut, um, we have Mr. Ken Michaels, host of uh, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everyone. And joining us tonight, as he does every so often, um, from Beetle Brunch. Where, if I can plug myself, I am on next week, but yeah. that will be after after this after this uh, comes out, Mr. Tom Frangioni. Hello, Hello, Tom. Hello, guys. Thanks for having me back on. Always a pleasure. And you're you're and and he's even he's even here in light of the World Series. What a what a brave guy. <laughs> well, you know, look as I said, we'll we'll go home National League champs this year. That's uh, there we'll you go. Back, when we get back to Opening Day next year, we'll get to watch him raise. Raise the flag, you know, there the, you go. Uh, the NL champ flag. So. And that is, and that, and having watched the Giants uh, get the rings, the, all that ceremony stuff is very cool. So even yeah, even um, halfway. So I'm glad. Yeah. I'm I'm happy for you guys. Anyway, here's here's what we're going to talk about this oh, week. Oh, uh, uh, Steve, just one thing. We probably should let people know that Alan Cozen is not with oh, us. Yeah. Ah, in absentia. Yes, because oh, he's mm-hmm. covering yes. covering a classical music concert. Yes, he's here in spirit. Uh, Mr. Cozen is not here. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Sure. So here's what we're going to do tonight. Um, during the week, I was uh, writing about um, Andy White, and I came across a picture, a very vintage picture, yeah. of our uh, of Tom Frangioni and Andy White together at one of um, Charles Rosenay's uh, Beatle conventions. And I went, oh, okay. And I soon found out that Tom and Andy had, you know, it was more than a one-shot deal here. That Tom and Andy, Tom and Andy knew each other for quite a while, and I thought, um, since there really wasn't a lot of detail in anything that I saw about Andy, I thought maybe Tom would like to come on. Uh, we'd invite Tom on to talk about Andy, and he actually has some very fascinating information about, you know, about Andy and Andy's. Um, you know, later years here. And so Tom, let's talk, let's talk uh, about a little about Andy. When did you first meet? Well, actually I first met Andy. Um, it was in the mid eighties. Um, I read about him in a newspaper here in New Jersey. It was, you know, kind of a, a human interest story saying, Hey, you know, somebody that lives here in New Jersey played on a Beatle record 20 years ago. It was around the time of the, the 20th anniversary <laughs> release here of, of love me do. And said, oh, my God, you know, well, look at that. Somebody really part of the story, you know, lives, you know, 15 minutes from here. That that's got to be cool. Wouldn't it be great to, you know, to to meet him and 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 boy, what a great exclusive for the somewhat newly launched Good Day Sunshine magazine, which can I can you wrote for for Good Day Sunshine for years. Yes. Uh, for many years. Charles Rosenay's uh, one of the earlier fanzines. And I said, boy, wouldn't that be cool? And I said, it, it can't be this easy, right? Go to the phone book and look him up. And I said, oh, my God, he's in the phone book. Uh, <laughs> it was like a moment out of the jerk. You know, there's my <laughs> in the phone book. Um, called him up, told him who I was and what I did and said, you know, would it be OK if you know, I came by to you know, do a short interview with you? And he said, yeah, sure. But you know, when's good? I mean, he was very, very agreeable to it. Went to his house. Uh, he was living in Montclair, New Jersey at the time. And, you know, I got to meet him. Um, and he had his drum kit set up in the living room. I guess he rehearsed there or whatever. And we started yakking about, well, the obvious, you know, love me, do, P.S., I love you. But I actually listened back to the tape just recently, um, you know, over the week. And I was, I was, at, I had never transferred it to, to digital. I still had the old tapes. And mm-hmm. I finally transferred it to digital and listened back to it at the time. And, 
any number of things struck me, like one, how little we really knew uh, at the time. We didn't have all this wealth of scholarly information. And one of one of my favorite moments from the interview was, um, you know, talking about P.S. I love you and love me doing. I said, you know, did you plan anything else that day, expecting the interview to just kind of die right there? And you know, I mean, I played on those two tracks. So no, no, he says I played on Please Please Me. I started thinking, wow, this guy, I mean, he's he's 50. He's probably losing it already. Um, <laughs> yeah, watch that. Watch uh, yeah. that. Listen, I'm in the club, too. Okay. So okay. Uh, I said, well, you know, the old, the old, the old guy, maybe, maybe he doesn't remember or, you know, he wasn't doing it in, in a way like a lot of people, you know, um, you know, would, would claim to. Um, I played on all the early Beatle records and he wasn't, you know, doing that at all. And obviously, we 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 the scholars didn't know anything about this until the anthology when George Martin found a you know not even something at Abbey Road but in his you know personal collection uh, from that day with Andy playing not the you know not the you know the hit version or the the final master of Please Please Me but he's sure on a version of Please Please Me yeah. uh, and I rem- I remember the time in the anthology it struck me you know it, the anthology would have come out some you know twenty plus years later and I said. My God, he was right. Mm-hmm. But Andy was always you. Know, the, the picture you were referring to, Steve, was taken as you say at one of Charles Rosenay's shows, which was about a year later. And um, I'm not sure which ones Charles posted, but had a great one on there because the guest at the at the convention that year was Pete Best, who Andy had never met. That was it. Was it was it was it was, it was Pete Best and Andy together. Yeah. Yeah, so you, know, you talk about a Kodak moment right there, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, yeah. we introduced uh, Pete to Andy, which was kind of kind of a moment, um, and th- so that he was had, he had never met him. No, he they had never. Him. In fact, it was funny in the interview when I said, you know, gee, do, me if I played on a, a hit Beatle record, I'd tell everybody, anybody would be willing to listen. He says, well, you know, when people ask me, you know who you, you know, where would I have heard you? What records would you have been on? And I say, you know, I was on a Beatle record before Ringo. They say, oh, you're Pete Best. So he actually, the, the, I have the, the, the 20th anniversary 12 inch single, which I wasn't leaving his house on autographed with. Um, and he, that's actually how he signed it you know, to Tom best wishes, whatever. Andy white brackets, not Pete. <laughs> so, uh, that's kind of a cool piece, which I still have, and, and obviously I still treasure. Um, wow. Over the years, he had done a few things, um, one of which was was really, really a memorable night. I know he he, he was very moved by it, uh, as was his, his wife, who was a, a charming, charming lady named Thea. Uh, a foundation I did work with uh, at a previous employer was, you know, we were looking for some new fundraising ideas, and... Uh, long and short of it, we decided to pool our talents and then do a um, a benefit concert. If you've ever seen the movie Waiting for Guffman, it had nothing on us. Okay, we all realized that night just how little we know about putting on a show. Uh, one of the doctors that was involved uh, sat on the board of a, a local playhouse, the Paper Mill. Uh, so he he got us access to the room. Some dear friends of mine, the Smithereens, hailing here from Scotch Plains and uh, various points in New Jersey, offered their services uh, to be the house band. And, you know, another guy on the board had a friend who had a restaurant who took care of the catering, and somebody knew a photographer who took care of that, and somebody knew a printer who took care of programs. And we put together what I think was a real, real fun night, and it was called We Get By With a Little Help From Our Friends, you know, being it was a fundraiser and a support effort. And we... We had the Smithereens do a set of Beatles songs, and then they did a set of their own songs, and they kind of weaved them together. And linking the two sets was a guest appearance by Andy White. And what we had, you know, pitched in the program is we've got a little bit of Beatle history here tonight because Andy had just recorded the the remake of P.S. I Love You for the Smithereens' excellent cover album called B-Sides the Beatles, a collection of Beatle B-Sides. And, you know, that that's kind of cool. And, you know, the Pat, especially, but Dennis, Jimmy, you know, the, these guys are, are Beatle freaks just like us. They, they love the Beatles. And, you know, they're, they're not beyond telling people, you know, Andy White only ever played this song with two groups. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Andy recorded that song with them. It's on that that album and worth worth uh, checking out for sure. But 
we introduced them and put a whole page in the program like guess what people you know you know and i i always used to introduce him when he'd play at our our, our you know jams and things uh, I'd say, okay, you know, quick, show of hands, who here has played on a Beatle record? You know, and there's always one or two, you know, people who, you know, do it in jest. And I say, okay, which of you guys played on a number one Beatle record? <laughs> okay, yeah. so, yeah, that that thins the herd a little bit too. Um, so we made a, we kind of made a big deal of it, and he he was kind of like a rock star that night. It was really really cool. Uh, he got a lot of recognition, a standing ovation. Afterwards, you know, the Smithereens are always good about hanging out after the show and meeting fans and signing autographs and taking pictures. And Andy was right there. And, you know, Thea was even beaming, uh, looking at him, saying, you know, here's a guy who's usually at the back, whether he's touring, you know, and, and backing some, you know, touring ensemble, or, you know, if he's a hired hand in the studio, as, as George Martin called him in that, uh, that documentary, the, uh, the George Martin uh, video from a couple years back, he said Andy was the best drummer money could buy for a session. Um, you know, he was he was kind of in the back. Right. But this night he was a rock star. And that, that was that was a ton of fun. But one of the, one of my favorite stories, though, with Andy was in 1992, George Martin was doing a 25th anniversary, uh, like a speaking tour about Sergeant Pepper. And he you know, he played reels of tapes and isolated the tracks and stuff like that. And he was doing it here in New Jersey at the Count Basie Theater in Red Bank. And. Rick Glover, a good friend of of all of ours, uh -huh. uh, from Beatle right. Fan and the Fest and some of the shows and things like that. Rick actually flew up from Georgia for that, so he was staying at my house. And you know that afternoon, you know we're we're probably listening to a Beatle record or watching a video. And Andy calls the house, and he said, "Hey, do you know about this George Martin thing tonight?" We said, "Yeah, actually, we're going." I said, "You know," and and duh, the light bulb goes on. I said, "You should come." And he says, well, I've got a ticket. I really don't know how to get there. You go, would you mind if I rode with you guys? And we go, yeah, sure. So <laughs> right on the party, Glover is rolling tape in the back seat saying, you know, get a few words for Beatle fan. And we get there and, okay, you know, you, you've got to picture this. So it's Andy at this point is, he's certainly on the Medicare rolls at this point. Sure. Okay? Uh, or he's close to it. I guess he's in his early 60s. And we get there and we say, wouldn't it be cool? He says, you know, is there, isn't there some, do you think there's any way I could get to, you know, get a note back to him and say, hey, George, Andy White is here. And there we are. It's Rick Glover and me and a guy who's, you know, he's certainly a few years our senior. And we're trying to convince a guy at the door who is both disinterested and unimpressed um, that we're saying, no, no, really. This guy played on the Beatles record. <laughs> and, and you know, really, he's a friend of Mr. Martin. And can't you get him, can't you get a note to Mr. Martin saying that Andy is here? And this guy looked at us, you know, like, like we just got off a boat somewhere. Um, <laughs> you know, trying to, trying to bust into a George Martin. <laughs> you know what kind of troublemakers the, the George Martin can do. Oh, God. So um, that did not happen, by the way. The, we did not get to meet George Martin. Um, we were up the front, um, you know, and George kind of got in and out of there pretty fast. But um, it, a, a fun night. But as I say, a, a couple of real, uh, real surreal moments there. You know, trying to convince a security guard, no, this, this, this gentleman friend of mine really, really does know Mr. Martin and played on Beatle records. You know, uh, clearly the guy at the door had no, no inkling or no, you know, no affection for it. But that, that I always remember that story as being kind of funny. Andy just looking at this guy, looking like, do I really look like the kind of guy who's trying to crash a backstage? Do I really look like that? Mm. Um, you know, if you ever seen a picture wow. of him, he's always very, you know, dapper and reserved and, you know, genteel and all that. So uh, just kind of, that was just kind of a funny story. And like I say, him, you know, playing on the Smithereens record was kind of cool. And, you know, he was always, always willing to, to help out with stuff like that, whether it was for the charity. Uh, certainly he came to the fest uh, a couple times anyway that I can remember. Um, you know, always, you know, always a pleasure to have around. He, he's going to be missed. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's a, that's a great story. I was wondering though, if you, didn't they have a Q and a or anything that night? Uh, no, th this was, this was a very much a one way presentation. Oh, if it was okay. a Q and a, it would have been a home run. Sure. Um, right. You know, it would have absolutely been a home run. Um, but that, that wasn't how it worked. Actually, we, there was a, like a, um, you know, VIP ticket thing with a meet and greet for after, which, oh. which Rick and I had tickets for 
but Mr. Martin was taken ill that night. I mean, when I say he walked through the room, he came down the stairs, waved, and got in a car. I mean, you didn't get to see him. And a lot of people, you know, to digress for a minute, were, were saying, this is this is a rip or this bullshit. Mm, I, re I remember uh, that. Yeah his, his, yeah, his people made good on it. At least they, they said you could leave one item, they would get it to him, he'd sign it, and at least get that back. So we didn't get to, you know, to meet with him and gab with him or anything. Did get an autograph, which was kind of cool. Um, but that was about it. But it would have been cool to have uh, have him and Andy uh, shaking hands there. That would have been nice. Yeah, that would have been that yeah. would have been real. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ken. Go ahead. George Martin also did another show in New York City. Yeah, he did right that. around that time. Yeah, he did that too. There was New York and New Jersey. Yeah, I was at the one in New York. It was at I think Town Hall. Might have been. So yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Really enjoyable. Really, yeah. you know, Andy White always impressed me as being a very humble. Very yeah. modest guy, yeah. and I think you you were just saying this before. I'm kind of surprised there are so many people in Beatle history who have had the thinnest of resumes, as far as um, you know, their association with the Beatles, who have tried to you know rake it in in some ways. And he was the furthest from that. Yeah, you know, it was just one out of many accomplishments in his career. Yeah, I mean, you so. know, what was kind of cool, you know, I, I, that I learned. Um, during the first interview with him back in the mid '80s, and is certainly it's part of many of the um, the obituaries and and wrap up stories and tributes that you've read. I said, you know, gee, where else would I have heard you play? Um, and he's mentioning you know some records that not only are terrific records, but they're terrific drum records. Uh -huh. uh, certainly, it's not unusual by Tom Jones, um, mm -hmm. Shout by Lulu. I mean, some big right. big hits. Henry the Eighth. Henry the Eighth, right? Right. He's also the drummer on the first real, you know, no, I want to say real, one of the very first, um, you know, uh, for, first British rock albums, The Sound of Fury, the Billy Fury album. He drummed mm -hmm. the whole thing. So he's, you know, guy. He was a talented guy, and I mean, in his later years, um, you know, he, he, you know, he's still very active. Um, he taught drums, and he had, he was the drum sergeant in a, a pipe and drum corps. Um, you know, and, you know, used to do, you know, the, the parades and the drum competitions at, you know, at Scottish fairs and whatever, whatever, wherever else you would find a, uh, you know, a, a pipe and drum corps mm -hmm. hmm. that and I said, and, and teaching drums. That was his, uh, that was, that was how he did it. <laughs> you know, as we, yeah. as we well know from the fest, there are some people that have had, you know, it may be perhaps even a thinner resume in terms of connection to the Beatles right. and have written books. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm just yeah. curious if anybody ever brought up that notion to Andy about, you know, doing a book about this one session. Well, you know, it might be tough to do a book on the whole session. Yeah. Um, I remember asking him, like, you know, what, what do you remember about it? And he says, you know, Look, had I had I been doing a session with them after they hit it and everything, I'd say, "Wow, I'm going to be doing a Beatles session today." He says this was this was their first record. No one had heard them on a record unless unless you lived in Liverpool, you pretty much didn't know who they were, um, mm -hmm. you know, in '62. But I said, you know, what was weird, Andy? I said, you know, I had just uh, the prior summer, I guess, been over in England when they did that Beatles at Abbey Road show. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's summer of '83. And one of, if you've ever seen the video, or if, I don't know if anyone got to go, but the interview with Norman Smith, you know, he talks about, he says, oh, you know, and, you know, Ringo had come to that first session. They didn't know they changed drummers. And George, you know, he tells, he tells the story, you know, chapter and verse and says, and he says, and that's about all I remember about Andy, except he had this big old English sheepdog and he starts laughing. So I had asked Andy, I said, you know, what about, what, what's this thing with the sheepdog? <laughs> he says, oh, and he starts laughing. Uh, apparently, he went to pick up his pay one day, and he brought the dog with him over to Abbey Road, and they were set up for like a 60-piece orchestra doing a, a film, you know, backing track or soundtrack, you know, violins all over the place and harps and everything else. And the dog got loose in the studio with the leash still on him, and it got caught, and he, he apparently started just dragging down sheet music stands and, oh, God. and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, I, but again, now just think of the timing on that. That's 62. Um, this discussion, this interview was happening in 83, four, fives, and then you know, early to mid 80s. And, you know, he's remembering that. And, and frankly, Norman Smith is remembering that. I mean, it just had to be a sight to behold. Yeah. So, um, 
you know, so that clearly I wasn't there for that one. But, uh, you know, it, just the, the look on his face when I mentioned that Norman Smith remembered something about his sheepdog uh, mm. was just kind of funny. <laughs> Tom, did Andy ever say that, well, obviously there was only the one day when they were together, but did he ever have contact with the Beatles after that one session? No, I asked him that. He said he never did. Um, he had never met Ringo. Um, you know, so because the only place I would have thought he might have met them is, let's say, something like one of those poll winner concerts, you know, the oh. multi-act bills, you know, where they, they'd have, you know, the, the live house orchestra or whatever, you know, backing up whoever might be there, Herman's Hermits or whatever was going on there. So, uh, but no, he said he, he never did meet them after that. Tom, okay. were you, were you involved when, when the smithereens, uh, did the, uh, uh, played that live show and they let him play, uh, uh, love me do. Yeah, that was, that was the show. I actually produced that show for the okay. uh, foundation. Um, he came up and did love me do and, and PS, I love you. He did All both. Right. And, uh, the smithereens in, in best, you know, Beatle aficionado style, had their drummer playing tambourine. I... <laughs> they, uh, you know, they, they're very authentic that way. <laughs> so, yeah, that was uh, that was a show in 2008 here in, in Milburn, New Jersey. Al, you were there. I certainly was. Mark Lapidus was on hand. We had uh, we had a bunch of our, our good Beatle friends on on hand for that night. It was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Al, did you want to did you want to ask? ask uh, uh, yeah, I asked about the uh, you know about whether. Andy had ever considered uh, doing a book. No, you know, like, you know, I'm not sure if he was the British Hal Blaine. I mean, Hal Blaine's played on 10 gazillion records and tons and tons and tons and tons. I'm not sure Andy was, I mean, he was, he was a top session guy in England, you know, in the late fifties to probably early seventies. I'm not sure that it was as, as, as illustrious, and uh, prolific as, let's say, Hal Blaine um, or somebody like that. But um, no, you know, a book, I, I didn't ask him, but that that didn't seem to be up his tree at all. Mm-hmm. Was there a session that he played at before the Beatles that where George Martin was aware of him? Or was oh, he yes. just a name? George, George Martin used to, to hear Andy tell it, used to use him all the time. I went back to the, the George Martin box set. That nice, um, oh yeah, uh, my life in music. But yeah. unfortunately, um, session player details are very scant. Yeah, uh, for a lot of those records. Mm-hmm. Um, so I re- I really wasn't able to come up with much. And you know, I've been trying to to you know find. You know, pretty much everyone's been using the same examples. Certainly, love me do. P.S. I love you. And it's not unusual. And you might even find a few that mention shout. They don't seem to go much past that. Um, right, right. You know the Billy Fury record might get mentioned here or there, or the uh, the Herman's Hermits uh, Henry the Eighth. Uh-huh. That's about yeah. it. Um, would you? How would you? I and mean, I don't I don't know if this is a good question or not, but how would you compare him to uh, Bobby Graham, who played? You know, who was basically I guess yeah. you can compare to Hal Blaine and played on the Dave Clark Five stuff, and yeah. which, by the way, which nobody wants to. You know, which uh, you know, Dave Clark will never admit, but uh, right. you know, we all know that we all know that's true. Yeah, w- would you rank him in about the same as Bobby Graham? Well, it's it's hard for me to rank him because I don't know the sp- a lot of the specific records he played on. Like he tell me, oh, right. you know, I did a Lulu album. Okay, mm-hmm. you want to know how many Lulu albums I have? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have one. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. So it, it's kind of hard, which, which is kind of nice about the Billy Fury record. They used the same five guys on the whole. Like there was one bass player, one drummer, right. one guitar player. It wasn't this rotating cast of session guys. And mm-hmm. oh, there it is on the back of the album. You, you get the credits, um, you know, which, which wasn't the, Al, you could speak to this, wasn't the norm back then. Right. Not um, at all. You know, they'd call in a session. Well, here's, here's who's drumming for you today. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to rank him against anybody. Um, he did say that, you know, John and Paul were v- those are the two that he pretty much talked to at the session because right. they had a very to hear him tell it, a very clear picture of what they wanted this to sound like. Like in P.S. I love you with the you know that little Latin feel, the, the cha-cha thing going on uh, and playing a little bit behind the beat. Which actually reminded me of a great story. I was working for a guy once who was a 
a big music guy, not a Beatle fan specifically. He certainly liked them. And, you know, he, he was telling me one day, he says, you know, I heard a Beatle song on the radio today. And anybody who says Ringo Starr is not a great drummer just doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. He says, I heard a song today. And the drumming was just, it was a, like a half a step behind the beat, but it just took the record right along and it was great. He goes, next time you hear P.S. I Love You, listen to that drum. Uh, <laughs> I had to break this heart. So, you know, I said, well, you know, I'll, 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 I'll be sure to let the guy who did drum on that <laughs> that you feel that. Uh, but, you know, that's... Uh, that's just that's just that's not an Andy story specifically, but it's a, a nice tip of the hat to him. So, yeah, it, it really uh, is. So I say it's kind, of hard, it's kind of hard for me to assess. I mean, I've I saw him drum live. I saw him drum in the studio. I've heard certainly some of his records where I know it's him. I got news for you. I probably have heard a ton more of his records that I don't know it's him. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to assess him and say, gee, you know what? He was a really good with a pop drummer, a really good jazz drummer, a really good whatever, because I really don't know, you know, the 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 depth of his work. It's kind of hard to do on a session guy, you know, yeah. you know, and there's there's sadly very little written about him except for the obvious. Uh, yeah. You know the the Beatles. I mean, some of the some of the headlines and some of the you know the online stories where you know early Beatles drummer dies. Right, fifth Beatle. Oh. That that was the one. Oh, that, yeah. that, yeah. Fifth, fifth Beatle. You know, look. You know, I've had right. days. Where, you know, I've called Ken the fifth Beatle. <laughs> you know. um, but you know, it was kind of cool. Speaking <laughs> of you know the fifth or hundred and fifth or <laughs> wherever we are in the rank. Uh, our good friend David Bedford, you guys all know him, right? Sure. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. He's written a couple of great books about Liverpool. And his last book that was called The Fab 104. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and it was about 104 musicians who, you know, migrated their way in and out of, you know, the Quarry Men and, you know, all the early right. Beatles lives, the Silver Beatles or whatever. Um, right. And had all, and, and certainly the rotating cast of drummers. But the book ends with, you know, the Beatles' first recording session. Because certainly there are people playing on Beatle records after that. You know, orchestral players and certainly Billy Preston and Clapton and all those guys. But it ends with Andy White. And it's kind of cool that uh, the, the kind of the, the, early, the early years and the, the formation until Ringo is cemented, you know, he's, he's the 104th Beatle, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Mm. So, Lewis's, uh, Lewis's book has a lot of detail about that session, too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um yeah. if you're look if you're looking for information between David Bedford's book and Lewis's book, yeah. that's where you can that's where actually you can David it. used a, a photograph I provided him from the Smithereen session. Like so he had you know, he had a, ah. a, a nice stock early picture of Andy, you know, circa sixty two, what he would have looked like then. Uh that, that picture was printed in several of the, the online stories. It's the one him he's wearing like a tuxedo and a black bow tie and stuff behind mm-hmm. the drum kit. And then you know, showing him, you know, the latter day Andy, you know, and what may have been, I, I don't know, you know, I know he still did a lot of live work and teaching, but I don't know how many recording sessions he did after 2008. That may have been his, his last you know, studio session, which was uh, with the Smithereens. So the mm-hmm. nice picture of Smithereens and, uh, and Andy in the back of the book. Mm-hmm. Ironically, yeah. just a couple of days before Andy passed, the, uh, the new Beatles One Plus collection mm-hmm. came out, and of course, on the you know the one disc, uh, the first track mm-hmm. is the version of Love Me Do, which of course features Andy White on drums. So. Yeah, the, the the hit version. Yeah, um, exactly. It was kind of weird, and it, you know, I, I say this only in good humor. Um, you know, Al and I were comparing notes over the weekend that right. the disc had come out, and I said. Boy, you know, you know what's cool is where you know there's not a video for I don't know, you know, she loves you, that they do a performance one and you get the live audio. That's cool that they didn't just sync up the record to some you know ready steady go program or something. And we get you know I, I kind of liked having some new live audio. That's kind of like a, a nice ancillary or spinoff benefit of of this new set. And I said, but hell, why did they use the call it the Ringo version right. of Love Me Do on the video. You know, I mean, if they're going to use a studio version, use the hit version. And uh, Al, you quite rightly pointed out that the video was a the 20th anniversary one from mm-hmm. 82, right. where the whole the whole hook was, you know, here's the, the 
quote the alternate one, the one you never hear right. uh, with Ringo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's true. Yeah, which, yeah. by the way, you know that 20th anniversary single you, you mentioned, Lewis and Steve. This is a story he told when, and I, I remember this one from my first trip to England back in the 80s. Mark was our tour guide uh, on the Charles Rosenay, you know, sponsored tour. And he mm-hmm. was, you know, this is now 83. And, you know, it's everything is now cycling through a 20th anniversary. Okay. And, right. you know, the Love Me Do single had come out. And Lewison told us the story. Uh, he said, you know, how they, they once they decided that the, the Andy White version was the one that's going to be used on all future pressings and things, you know, that the, the other master was destroyed and that was it. He says, but now they, they realized the historical value, if you will, mm-hmm. and wanted to put out a commemorative release. And they contacted Mark because he was at the time, certainly before he was ever a Beatle big scholar, scholar like he is today or the you know the go-to reference guy he was you know kind of like britain's go-to collector trivia tour guide all that right. he, he mm-hmm. was all that um and they contacted him and he had an unplayed copy which emi's master was made from and he said and that they thought so much of it that they sent a courier around on a bicycle to come pick it up <laughs> wow <laughs> On a bicycle? On a bicycle. Swear to God. Next time you're talking to Mark Lewis and ask him that question. Oh, my God. Again, not an Andy story. In fact, by definition, not an Andy story. It's a Ringo story. But that's what they they thought so much of it, to find this unplayed copy of Love Me Do, from which they were going to master future pressings. Uh, They sent the guy around on a bike to come get it. (laughs) But, in in fact, to kind of segue, uh, since... It has been now a couple of weeks before the OnePlus collection came out. One of the reasons why we wanted to have you on was to get your uh, your expert analysis, since we kind of uh, went over much of uh, much of the of the set last week. Mm-hmm. We wanted to get your opinion. Well, you know, there, there's not a whole lot not to like. Um, what what is in there is fantastic. <laughs> I've seen some stabs at. Okay, yeah, that's great, but you know what they didn't put in there? You know, mm-hmm. take 43 of this and take 28 of that. And there's an alternate angle of, you know, revolution, right? There's a, there's a whole different, you know, set of camera angles in the revolution one, and should they have lifted every clip out of the anthology and, you know, and all that. And and you can bet that the one plus plus DVDs will be showing up, uh, <laughs> you know, showing up soon. But um, what what struck me first was how good it sounded. I'm more of a sound guy than a, than a picture guy. And, you know, look, in terms of, you know, timelines for remastering albums, certainly when they did it in 2009, you know, the, the albums hadn't been remastered in, you know, in a long time, and there was a good chunk of technological advancement, and the results were, were staggering. There's no other way to put mm-hmm. it, comparing the 09s to the 87s. Uh, even though we had little tastes of, you know, the one album and the, even the red and blue album were cleaned up nice. But that's only six years ago. Uh-huh. When I heard they were remastering one, I said, well, you know, how much more are they going to do to it than what they did in 09? Mm-hmm. How much more is there? And it sounds real, real, real good. But the video, the audio tracks to the videos, which, by the way, not going to find that in your local shop right there. You see that? Uh-huh. You see that? Yeah, we got uh-huh. a little... Yeah, this is this uh-huh. kind of a, uh, you know, one that you won't find on Amazon, but there's a, you know, a disc of the extracts for the, what are, you know, the alternates. Now, look, when they're remixing or mastering for the video, there's going to be slight tweaks to all the audio tracks. They're just, it's just going to have right. to sound a right. little... But there are... You know, certainly what I'm going to call alternate tracks. Let's define an alternate track. Something you won't find in the big black box from 90909. Okay, so there's a couple of BBC things which we got in there. uh, A couple of Sullivan shows. A Royal Variety show, which was kind of cool because the four songs they did at the Royal Variety, three of them made it to the anthology. This is the fourth Mm -hmm. one. So now we got the whole thing officially. Um, (laughs) You know, the the track from the Around the Beatles. uh, One of my very, very favorite audio tracks in there is the 
um, the Let It Be movie version of Long and Winding Road. Yes. Mm -hmm. just sounds so good. I can I mean, you know, looking at it, more than one person I know uh, has observed, boy, the Let It Be footage sure looks great. I can't wait to see the whole thing. I got news for you. I can't wait to hear the whole thing. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> because the sound on that was really, really good. The thing that really startled me the most were the two anthology tracks free as a bird and real love because mm -hmm. oh, right. yeah. oh, yep. oh. yeah. they hadn't been, <laughs> right they hadn't been re remastered since the anthology which i still refuse to believe is 20 years ago really? but i'm listening and i love both those tracks so much they you know i was listening back to free as a bird and you know you're hearing the the guitar leads you know dropped in in a couple different places and it's it's mm -hmm. different enough to be cool and then i i, I swear i had to rewind it and go what did he sing right there? They changed one <laughs> word in the lyric. I'm like, was that just a goof just to do it? <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, and then yeah. of course they played, I, played the ending back. Yeah, they played it forwards instead of backwards. Hmm. But um, you know, the the last verse uh, for those of you that haven't uh, gone, I don't want to spoil it, but just go listen to the the chorus that George sings on his own and compare it back to the original anthology, and hmm. you'll hear, you'll hear it just slightly different. Um, and of course, the ending is it's obvious, you know, that they're not using the backward loop that they use in John's you know, uh -huh. natural or, you know, frontward uh, voice. So there's there's, mm. there's uh, you know, not quite 20 tracks that are one way or another new. They're either remixed for the first time, remastered for the first time or released for the first time, you know, officially uh, you know, as a as a, you know, as a real track and not just, you know, buried somewhere in the anthology or awesome. not making it onto the anthology album, but real new live tracks. So uh, it's kind of neat. We get the two different intros of, um, of the live jamming they did before Hey Jude uh, with David Frost. Um, those, those are, I just love those. I mean, because being a collector for so many years, I mean, Al, how, how many versions of that you think we've gone through between VHS copies and, Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know all these uh, you know chronology DVDs and everything else. Uh, a considerable number, <laughs> right? And I mean, yeah. <laughs> and we've seen them, and boy, I mean, even the official you know peaks at it that we had in the anthology proper, yeah, um, they looked great, but they they're just they're they're lifelike at this point. They really are lifelike. Mm -hmm. uh, the visuals in it, but uh, for me, you know, I, I watched the whole thing that week, and I you know. Clearly, I, did, I needed to just immerse myself in it. And by the way, they did a beautiful job. Uh, if you buy the one plus, you know, with the, the two DVDs and your choice of, you know, uh, DVD or video, uh, or rather a DVD or Blu-ray, the the book that comes in it, you know, with it's got a you know a still or two from the video and you know all the credits, a direct mm -hmm. and a date and and you know chart performance and everything else you wanted to know about the songs. You know, they they really did a pretty exhaustive job here. Of course, you know, no conversation about the one album uh, for me is complete without saying, but the most obvious way that, <laughs> that I want to hear it, it still isn't done. And that's, you know, the, the mono single versions, which were the, the hits by definition, um, would still love to hear that uh, come out of, you know, come out of Apple, you know, in, in official form, but to be determined. <laughs> so. Yeah, as I, as I said last week. Uh, I want to hold your hand. Should only be heard in mono. Oh yeah, um, you know they're, they're, you know, the early records. Look, you know that I'm sure that's that's been fodder for things we said today. It's certainly been fodder for Beatle Fest discussions and uh -huh. other radio shows. Well, those the early records. I mean, they just sound that much better in mono. They they, they just do. Um, they, that's how they were mixed. That's how they were intended to be heard. And I mean, I want to hold your hand. Just you know. Just screams to be done in mono. Exactly. Mm. See, Ken, um, well, Ken, and I last, that... Ken and I last week both came out on on the side that it, the stereo wasn't wasn't completely bad. Uh, you know, oh, I mean, I like the completely stereo. bad I... in here. <laughs> There's nothing completely I... bad about this set. No, you know. no, but I have said the the first two British albums to me sound better in mono. Mm. Oh, they do. But yeah. I think once once you get into a hard day's night, I think a hard day's night sounds terrific in in stereo. Sure. But the first two, but you know, I want to hold your hand. I think sounds pretty good in stereo. Yeah, but um, I mean, they did a nice job with the stereo nine oh nine oh nine mixes. I have no problem with those. 
Um, but if I if I just get a hankering to go here with the Beatles, I I'm going for the white box typically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Yep. Yep. So. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, I, they did it. No, they did a great job. They really, really did. Now the question is, you know, what are they? Since the response has been relatively good, mm-hmm. you know, what are they looking at? What yeah. are they looking at next? That's the question. Well, the, and, the good news here is this: this one looks like they really had their finger on the pulse of the fan. Um, this is what the fans would have. Um, I, I I think they're 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 perking up and you know and took good notice this time you know the the extras on this thing you know the the paul and ringo commentaries kind of cool that that was a one-time watch for me Mm -hmm. Um, but you know the the meat and potatoes you know i mean the the revolution video i mean like the guitar just jumps out paperback rider and rain i mean the the you know those the first snare hits in rain when it comes out it's 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 startling how come nobody mentions eight days a week that blew me over oh it's, it's mm. great i mean you know the of course like we said with let it be when you watch it you watch the clips that are used here you say boy i can't wait to see let it be well you know if you've been waiting for shea stadium go get a look at that eight days yeah footage. Uh, yeah That's i mean uh, the, when i was sitting there watching that the, you know because i got the set early i was no i was just completely stunned that my mouth dropped i could not believe how clear mm-hmm. it looked it looked great the other and another one that that looked good was the um uh, within you, without you. Um, yeah. I that looked really good too. I that yeah. looked really crystal clear. I couldn't believe that. I mean, so sharp. But I mean, yeah, there's just so many things. Uh, I know there have been people that have been talking about the Blu-rays with some fuzziness. Uh, I, you know, I I haven't really, you know, I mean, I figure a lot of that stuff is 50 years old, and and you know, with 50 year old stuff, there is going to be some inherent difficulties whether we yeah. unfortunately whether we like it or not you know yeah but i think they did a wonderful job i really i really do sure so. yeah i think that yeah. that for me you know the the videos that they made uh, there was that one day in 65 mm-hmm. when they uh-huh. they made 10 videos those i treasure a lot because even though they're really quick and spontaneous you kind of get the feeling they were they were all done in twickenham and they had to grab whatever props were around, and it certainly looks like that yeah. in so many of the yeah. videos. You know, it's <laughs> the, the video, which I think is hysterical for for I feel fine. It looks like there's, um, I guess it's like a punching bag yeah. in mm-hmm. front of George as as the microphone. That's hysterical yeah. to me. It's like whatever they can find there, or uh, the video for Day Trip, or with the with the airplane and the train. You know, where you know that it's not a real thing. It's just, mm-hmm. it looks so bad, but oh, yeah. it's funny yeah. just oh, to watch this stuff. Or the one where they're eating the fish and chips. I mean, that, you know, yeah. that's a, and that, that, what they, by the way, they showed that uh, on, uh, during the IT special. So, yeah. yeah. No, it's, so, I mean, it's, you know, what was kind of nice is that, you know, for uh, disc two with the extra versions and things, you know, getting the alternate um, hello goodbyes and things like that. But what what kind of, you know, we were talking about B-sides before, just, you know, within the context of the smithereens. Look at some of the, the, the you know, quote, extras. The, not the main stuff. The, the ancillary stuff that they threw on, just kind of threw on disc two. Mm-hmm. Videos that are in there for Strawberry Fields. A day in the life. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is the B-reel, okay? Uh, right, just, right. You know, re- I mean, my God, the, 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 the the songs that are in there, it's just, it's incredible. And, you know, Strawberry Fields is still such a terrific video to watch. There's so much good imagery and color and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and the lot, the, the quasi live uh, revolution. Now, this is a family show, right? Uh-huh. Um, but you, you know, <laughs> yeah, sort of. Okay. You guys know the, the, the whole thing with George in that video, right? This is the first time that they've used that, that angle because they, they certainly didn't do it in anthology. Where after John sings the first line, George is seen mouthing something to Paul. Oh yeah, right. Mm-hmm. That so they've they've used the alternate angles or cutaways and things for the better part of geez probably the last twenty to thirty years. But I mean the last time they might have used the the original, you know, a series of, of camera shots may have been like in the Complete Beatles or something back in the eighties. But mm-hmm. if you look closely. There are many, including scholars such as Rob Rodriguez. 
who, <laughs> who, um, who have it on, on some form of good authority of what George is saying there. And, well, you'll just have to go watch it and just think to yourself, George is saying to Paul, John smells like shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I look at it and go, yeah, that's kind of what he's saying. Um, uh, I, I I don't know that it is, but it sure looks like it. So uh, mm-hmm. until we get a real good, f- you know, until they do something better than 5.1 and we can isolate that little microphone clip, uh, I don't know what else we can do. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure somebody, I have a feeling, will, somebody will do that. I have a feeling just from that tidbit of information you gave, Tom, that the, the sales are going to zoom right yeah, now. They, for, yeah, uh, or <laughs> right now, YouTube, he's probably trending. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. There we go. There we go. But, wow. Yeah. Okay, I mean, there's not really much else that you can that you can say. I mean, we pretty well I mean, it's it's just it's just really good. I mean, for once, you know, for all the complaining, for example, that everybody did about the US album set and the Japanese set, you know, they really did very well this time. Very, very yeah. well. I mean, it was it was quite a day at the mailbox uh that day that you know, 116 was uh not only the Beatles set, uh, there was the new Dylan. You know, there was a deluxe version of that. Uh, you know, that came the same day. So my my poor mailman, uh, you know, probably hurt himself <laughs> that day. But yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, the, it's been the, the, he hasn't been this mad at me since the day the Lewison book and the BBC, uh, the Kevin Howlett book came out same day. Oh God! Right, <laughs> right. So uh, right. that's how it goes. What did you guys think of the new videos that were shown in here, like the one for Come Together, which was an animated one? Yeah. And then there was also one for, um, for Get Back, which was made for Let It Be Naked. Well, the, the Get Back, Let It Be Naked one was kind of sort of, you know, the rooftop thing. Yeah. I mean, obviously right. they cut yeah. away to Billy Preston down in the basement and stuff like that. Right. But I, I think, Ken, the, the um, Come Together one was actually done for the launch of the Beatles one or the Beatles website, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. And okay. that's that's pretty garish. I mean, you know, quality. It, it looked out of pl- it looked out of place to me. I think if there was one mm. one yeah, it is demerit, one demerit for that set that gets it because it really, you know, you kind of I I've sat and tried to watch it. I've kind of went, eh, it really yeah. doesn't belong. You know, it's too bad yeah. that they couldn't have done something else. You know, put in some. That it it drags some drag some rare footage that we haven't seen from somewhere. Yeah. And, or it, stills mm. or anything, you know. Yeah. Anything, yeah. yeah. Why, they just... had, why they felt they had to use that, I really don't know. That was that was a mistake, I think. Yes. Well, since I you've think seen, so. Tom, since you've seen The Love Show any number of times, mm. uh, the, the video that's in here for Tomorrow Never Knows and Within You Without You, has that particular one ever been part of the show? No, because actually that that song, I mean, I don't want to ruin this surprise for people who may not have seen the show or planning to see it. There's for that that particular track in the show, it's a, an interactive audience thing where you know, I'm not going to say any more than either you're on top or on the bottom. Um but it's it is a point in the show where uh video is not really the 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 game plan there it's an interactive you know prop that that gets you know shared among the 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 whole crowd really really, Um, tom because i've i've seen the show and i my memory as foggy as it is at 64 um um seems to recall (laughs) differently i i think it was in there but I saw maybe not, it. Maybe not during that song, because remember during that song, you you know the part I'm talking about with with what covers the crowd, right? I yeah, I I barely, but uh, yeah, mm. I I do I do know what part you're talking about, but I seem to recall that in in the show. I don't know why, but I do. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe, it, it, it may be used, you know, and interspersed in different parts of it, but for for sure, for sure, that song in the show is. Mm-hmm. Is a you know an interactive okay. set. I mean, um, one of our Beatle fan contributors, Nikki Dennett, my cousin, uh-huh. uh, actually just saw the show hmm. first time last week, and you know I had told her I said just you know sit high up. It's better it's better on top than the bottom, and you know that again it's a family show here, but uh, <laughs> I, I prefer I prefer the the aerial view that rather than the uh, right the looking up view. 
and it, it is a it is a you know it is a centerpiece of the production. Uh, so if that's used, that you know that imagery of the you know, the kaleidoscope and all that stuff that they use, I think you're right, Steve. You know, I'm just trying to recall where in the show it may have been, um, but I'm I'm fairly certain it's not during that song. It's it's been a while since I've seen it. I mean, it's been a yeah. couple of years, mm. so I don't. It's been so long, and I know they also <laughs> change it a lot. They, yeah. the, the, show gets cha- the show gets changed. So when you see, if you've seen it a couple of years ago, it's not the same as it is now. You they know, adjust. I actually remember one weekend I saw it on both nights that I was out there, and it was different. And I asked somebody there, and uh, it was the the Lucy in the Sky thing with the guy with the big wheel and the cart and everything. Mm-hmm. And apparently, mm-hmm. like he wasn't available. That was sick. And they have like placeholders. You know, <laughs> that they, you know, where they use, you know, just they have a, you know, a go-to clip or a go-to set of, you know, video mm-hmm. and whatever, or a light show or whatever, you know, whatever it is they, they put in its place. I seem to think it was Yellow Submarine or something. But they 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 have a contingency plan, I guess, if, you know, for you people who have seen the show, you know, if uh, during help one of the skaters can't make it, they do something else. You know, so uh, to your point, you're, you're right, Steve, they do swap out different segments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I saw it, I think, in 2008 or 2009. Mm. I don't remember if Within You, Without You was in there. Yeah. But well, you, you remember that part I, of the show, right, Ken? The one where there's, that, there's like um, a white sheet yeah, that goes the, over the stage? The big sheet. Yeah. I, seem to, I seem to recall Octopus's Garden being played then Mm-mm. for well, some well, reason. It, maybe they were you know, swapping out the, the, that, that um, you know, the, for when I, I remember Octopus's Garden being the one that starts out. It's got... Uh, the, the um, you know, underground, the water, uh, like the jellyfish floating all over the place. Uh-huh. That's what I remember about Octopus's Garden in that show. Okay. I've got to see the show again. Mm. I've only yeah, seen I, it once. I, I do, too. I should go. We haven't been to Vegas since then. And, uh, Field trip. Uh, there we go. Yeah. But if we all, maybe we should all just meet in Vegas and do the show there. Hmm. Uh, hmm. 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 We'll have a we'll have a love fest. Uh, no. Ooh. I, I used to go. love it going out there. My last job, but we used to go out there once a year for a, a convention or a, a meeting or something like that. So it was getting to see it every year, which was kind of cool. <laughs> mm. So, uh, but ha- I haven't seen it in in several years. But uh, Nikki saw it last week. Said it was dynamite. Still. Hmm. Okay. Well, anyway. Does anybody anybody have anything else to uh, discuss? I, I was just going to briefly mention that British ITV special that I wrote about. Uh, has anybody else besides me seen it? I have a copy coming, but I have not seen it. It is really good, I have to say. Much better than I... I mean, a lot of these, you know, there, a lot of these uh, Roundup specials are pretty, you know, weak. Yeah, but uh, and this has its you know its weak moments. It's got a lot of people that really don't belong to be in there, deserve to be in there. But uh, there are a lot of people that should be in there. I mean, uh, everyone from Frida Kelly to you know people from the fan club, from you know Tony Bramwell's in there. Um, I mean, there's just a ton of people, and there's a and there's a a little surprise at the end. I I won't ruin it, but it's uh, it's. It's very nice, uh, and of course, the big part, the most interesting part for me was the Giles Martin at the in the recording studio, and that that is cool. And I really hope, as I said, as I wrote on online on Beatles Examiner, that um, somebody picks it up here. I really, really do. Um, and I think that if people were to, you know, uh, hopefully people can write to. A Palladia and well, actually Palladia Access and VH1 are all the same company. They're all via Viacom, but uh, maybe maybe we can get Viacom to to do something with it. So I don't yeah, know. We'll yeah, well, you know that could even be a, a public TV. You know, that yeah, like I was just thinking that. That's possible too. I didn't even think about that, but yeah, that's a good idea. That's a that's very possible. In fact, that's probably something that it makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. to do that. So let's we, we can we can help. Okay. You know if there are plans to release that, Steve? No, no, there are not. And usually those things don't get don't get released. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's very rare when those when any of that. I mean, we're still we're still waiting for the uh, the CBS 
tribute to be released. And yeah. that has been released. In fact, that surprises me more than anything that that didn't get released. Mm. So after all the hoopla behind right. that, you yeah, would have thought, yeah, right, you would really I mean, would have. Yeah, fiftieth anniversary, everything. Um, so. Yeah, the the reason I ask about it being released is that's when PBS will latch on to a lot of music programs for like mm. the pledge drives. Like, sure. Yep. You know, if there's, right. there's a new DVD, yeah. and that's what they give away. You know, for a hundred dollar contribution, you get a copy of the DVD or something. Right? Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, this morning the that that special or in for, uh, it's possible. I, I'm wondering if possibly the DJ that was doing the morning show on a uh, particular classic classic hit station in, here in Pittsburgh may have seen your uh, your dispatch on this, Steve, because. Mm. He um, uh, made it into a contest to guess what was the number one highest, uh, you know, highest voted <laughs> uh, song from that particular special, mm. which, okay. which is such a huge surprise. It's yeah, such a I, know. Fun upset, I know. You know. I know. I know. That was a. That was a. I mean, that is the whole. You know, all those as they said in the story, the ratings pretty much were you could have guessed. But there were a couple of things. There was the one thing in particular that I mentioned in the story of, of uh, we can work it out rating ahead of Day Tripper that just very really was surprising to me. I, I Why? Still, because I thought because I've always thought Day Tripper for Amer- at least for well again we were talking about British fans as opposed to American fans. Um, mm. You know, um, I've always thought uh, Day Tripper was a stronger song anyway. But what can I say? Yeah, well, in America, we can work it out. Was the number right, one in America? Exactly. We're right, that yeah. was our number one here. Mm-hmm. But you know what is surprising? You know what the biggest selling single for the Beatles was in in England was actually "She Loves You." Right. right. Mm-hmm. So you might have thought that that would have ranked number one, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't. Mm-hmm. So I don't uh, know. I don't know. Should we know. tell the folks what number one is, or does well, it matter? Well, they can probably guess that it's Hey Jude. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Because right. I mean, that, that, that is, it seems like every time there's any kind of a list of either favorite Beatles songs, favorite oldies, uh, whatever, um, Hey Jude is almost invariably number one. Mm-hmm. I listed the entire 27 songs mm. in the story I wrote on it. If you look right. on Beatles Examiner and look for the uh, the ITV Beatles story that I did, um, it, the, the the 27 songs are there. Mm. So you can, if you're if you're dying of curiosity to find out mm. what they are, they're all there. And yet, you know, it's kind of interesting. The most recent, you know, any kind of something that you could quantify, other than a you know a fan vote or something. The last mm-hmm. time that there was something to measure, you know, Beatles song for song for song was when they, they put them on iTunes. And the number one there wasn't even a number one song yeah. in the set. Mm. It was the sun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know that. Yeah, that was. Uh, not a bad. Was, <laughs> not, I know that was interesting, too. You know, yeah, which, in fact, was one of the guesses this morning on that morning show. A yeah. morning radio show. Some, some really? guy called in and guessed that it was Here Comes the Sun, yeah. which, of course, wasn't even a sink. Right, it's not even on. <laughs> well, you know, for that matter, Al, you know, there is the version of Help that's in there, but that's another. This is true. You know? There's another show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. I I know. I thought about the I thought about that too. You know that they use some stuff that wasn't even on the, you know they they use live tracks in some cases. Which okay. Well, well video, but I like say we said at the top though. You know, in the for videos. Okay, if you're gonna do a, a video for um, she loves you. Okay, and there wasn't one. I mean, the, what what are the options here? You could do a bunch of stills. You could sync it up to some you know ready steady go performance or something. Or, or some combination of that and stock news footage. There's any number of ways you could go about doing it, much like they did for the Love Me Do uh, anniversary clip. Uh-huh. Um, mm-hmm. I'm really okay with, I know you guys can't, well, you guys can see it, but most in Radio Land won't. Ooh, look at that. All the, uh, you know, the cool <laughs> audio that's come out uh, as part of this set. I'm, I'm kind of okay having a, you know, a new, quote, official release of you know she loves you from i guess that one's from the drop-in show in sweden mm-hmm. uh, yeah you know look we've seen which is a over the that's years. a great live show that's too dynamite drop mm-hmm. show they were they were right on that day uh, yeah that was one of john's favorite you know performances that they did when he was 
collecting uh, underground releases back in the day. Mm-hmm. Was the uh, the Sweden show, and of course, you know the tracks that they pulled from that for the anthology. I mean, they're, they're fantastic, right? So you know, I'm I'm okay having a a an officially live released track from the drop in show uh, added to the uh, added to the archive. I'm I'm fine with it. even if it is on a a video disc rather than a you know rather than an audio disc. The the audio disc will find its way. It will mm. find its way. <laughs> um, <laughs> Are you? Te- what are you doing? Are you? Are you? You're 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 tempting us there, Thomas. Oh, uh, not me. No, I wouldn't do that. Oh, come on now. Uh, <laughs> but um, you do have the new address, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe rabbit. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, these are these are the the, the audio extracts right off the discs. But I mean, there's it's kind of cool in that it's it's so varied. Of stuff that you can mm-hmm. compile from these things, so you know you get a BBC track, let's right, say, right. you know, maybe it's you, which same as the album, but it's kind of again, let's call it the stuff not in the big black nine oh nine oh nine box. The you know you can get a lot, a couple of live Sullivan tracks, one from sixty four and one from sixty five. You get a track from Paris, one from around the Beatles, uh, one from the Drop In Show. Throw in a love track, throw in a couple of Let It Be Nakeds, the David Frost Show, and it's kind of like one of those old you know plain white label yes. you know, bootleg things that yeah. just had a, a, any mix of anything on it mm-hmm. because it's kind of all over the place uh, mm-hmm. but I, I definitely wanted to, to hear the audio extracts uh, spend quite a bit of time in the car each day and uh, that that's a nice play it really is a lot of, lot of cool mm-hmm. audio tracks in this thing so yep. uh, that's what Absolutely. the only one I'm, I'm not thrilled with from an audio perspective and it has nothing to do with this set it's how the audio was done was the promo for words of love from bbc2 oh, it's yeah. a great set of graphics but uh for those of you who've obviously seen it now as part of this set or otherwise you know when there's i don't know a roller coaster ride going by and everybody's going yay um <laughs> or, or you know when mal puts his hand through the the windshield of the van mm-hmm. and the glass right. that doesn't translate so well uh into the audio track but that is how it was done did you hear Alan's comment last week about eight days a week about the audio? They uh, took the uh, edit piece off the end. Did you hear him? I did not hear that. Yeah, he, he was talking about that last week, that they mm-hmm. took the edit piece off the end and basically created a new version. I mean, there's all sorts of I'm sure there's, you know, there's all sorts of people that have found all sorts of things, you know, mm. I mean, I'll have to they have to listen to that. Yeah, I, I did listen to it and I. You know, I haven't done an A-B comparison, so um, I didn't, you know, it, it didn't hit me. I can, I think I heard what he, what he was talking mm. about, but at the same time, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many of these things where, you know, where you get all, you know, people, you know, pretty much thinking they, you know, they, they know what they know. And I'm, I'm not saying Alan is wrong, but because he is probably, because I'm sure he's not, but it's just, I, I didn't, I didn't pick it up, but. Anyway, um, I mean, I th- there's I'm sure there's uh, all sorts of things, the free as a bird thing and the real love. The real love thing is what caught me the earliest. Oh, part. right out of the gate. Oh, uh-huh. right. oh sure. yeah. Oh God, yes. That that was it. Anyway, gentlemen, we have run out of time. I would love to keep this going all night, except you guys are a little later on in the evening than I am, so I don't want you guys falling asleep on me. <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna say we're gonna wrap it up and say uh, uh, thank you for listening, everyone. If you want to get in touch with us, you can send your comments to things we said today radio show at gmail dot com, or you can send us a note on Twitter at things we said fab. I'm gonna go around the horn and let you guys uh, tell how to get uh, in touch with each of you. Hey, Al, starting with you, Al. Uh, mainly through. Uh, www.beetlefan.com or www.paradingpress.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook, uh, Al Sussman, uh, also, and on Twitter, uh, at a sus, a s u s s four nine. Uh, Ken, uh, you can reach me at my email address, which is every little thing at att.net. And also uh, take a look at my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And I also have a Facebook page for Ken Michaels. Okay. Tom? It's classified. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, actually, best way to get a hold of me is through the uh, Beetle Brunch website. It's brunchradio.com. There's a little button on there that says contact us, and we have each of our profiles on there. Just click mine on and uh, and ask away. Okay. Not, not through the New York Mets and, web, website? No, unfortunately, no. Uh, there or through the David Peel fan club. Uh, ah, one, one okay. Two. Okay. Um, Actually, Tom Tom has a really good profile. A pro- yeah. you know, on, on the website. <laughs> Very good. Very good, sir. Okay. And you can get a hold of me through uh, by writing Beatles Examiner at gmail.com. I also have a Facebook page under my name, uh, Steve Marinucci. And there's also a, a group, uh, a Facebook group that I moderate called Beatle News and Commentary, where I post links and we can talk about all sorts of things. So, gentlemen, I think that's it for the week. We look forward for you tuning us in uh, next week. Uh, we're also on uh, iTunes and YouTube. You can find the shows there, uh, so you can find us everywhere. Take us to your gym workouts. I've done it. It's fun. But anyway, we'll uh, talk to you next week. We will see you next time. Next time.